can do. And we're back, like we never left, in the car for episode number 252 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Monday evening here with me in New York. Once again, we're going to skip past all that promotional jazz and get right to the guts of the episode. The 20th entry in our continuing series of The Best Movie You've Never Seen. And this one, we've got to go way, way back. Let me turn a little light on for you. we got to go way, way back to the early 1940s, and I believe 1941, the year of Citizen Kane, if I'm not mistaken. This one I could be wrong about. And it is a Hollywood comedy. It has elements of a screwball comedy. It has elements of the road movie. It has elements of very serious timely depression era, although the depression had just ended, drama, it is every inch a unicorn film directed by one of the masters of the era, Preston Sturgis, and starring the great Joel McRae and the one and only Veronica Lake. Now, I had heard of this film, but didn't see it until New York University Film School. That's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. And I watched it, it's impossible to believe that this is almost three decades ago, but I watched it in spring 1995, the semester, and the course I watched it in was Hollywood and its alternatives, which was taught by an absolute genius, brilliant uh, David Legowski, who I think ended up teaching at Manhattanville, if I'm not mistaken, but he was, if I'm allowed to say it, he was always my favorite professor because he was brilliant, genius, encyclopedic knowledge of movies, but he was also very relatable. And he gave us a big wind-up to the movie, and he some trivia in the days where the internet was in its infancy. There are certain things that now, if you ever read about the movie, you already know that Veronica Lake was not just a little bit pregnant during filming. She was, like, really, really pregnant. But if you watch the film... The skill of Sturgis and the way that Veronica Lake positions her body, you would not know that she was like six, seven, eight months pregnant. There's no way that you would ever, you would ever have come to that conclusion. The film is now more than 80 years old and it's still timely because it deals with themes that we can identify with. And to be more specific, Joel McRae plays a very successful Hollywood filmmaker. I guess you could say it would have been like a Steven Spielberg when Spielberg was mostly making lighter films, where he was he was seemingly content to make movies, make people laugh, edge of your seat, tug at the heartstrings, but not the Spielberg of Schindler's List, the Spielberg that had a more hopeful, I hate to say it that way, but a more hopeful worldview, like his first big scale science fiction film, Close Encounters, takes a very favorable and optimistic view of life elsewhere. Whereas the Spielberg 30 years later making War of the Worlds, motherfuckers are all trying to kill us. We're going to fuck them right back. Fuck those aliens or whatever. So John Sullivan is the name of the filmmaker, not the boxer. (laughs) John L. Sullivan, famous boxer. He is a successful purveyor of light fare, light comedies. And we can imagine today somebody in a certain branch of the arts, it doesn't necessarily have to be motion pictures, but somebody who makes a great living and is actually very good at that. They want to do something else. Basketball players want to be rappers. Rappers want to be movie stars. Movie stars want to be musicians. It's in our nature to want more and to want to be more. And in the world of this film, The main character, successful filmmaker, 
He's made mostly light comedies, made a shit ton of money for himself and the studio. The country is coming out of the Great Depression, but there are still a significant percentage of people who are hurting. I mean, we talk about this today, 30 years ago. Even if it's not a recession, there's a percentage of people who are hurting. So he acknowledges how good he has it, how lucky he's been, how lucky he continues to be to have the career that he has enjoyed, but he wants to do something more meaningful. He wants to make a movie about, in some way, the plight of homeless people and the indigent in the United States of the post-depression era. Now, he doesn't say, it's not the word salad that I just gave you, but that's the gist of it. He wants to make meaningful art. He doesn't want to just keep pumping out these, it's not that they're bad, but he feels like maybe I can do more. Maybe I can make a really important movie here. Okay. So the studio and certain handlers, they go about the kind of process of preparing him to make the movie, but he doesn't want, he wants to do actual hands-on research, which means, to put another way, he wants to actually go out on the road. He wants to experience at least some bits of life without the safety net of his money, of his fame. He's not going to tell anybody who he is. And if back then, this is not the social media era in 1941. You could just blend in because not that many, the average person wouldn't have known what a filmmaker looked like anyway. So he wants to go on the road. The studio doesn't, they're not going to let him, they're not going to contractually allow him to take any risks. And Veronica Lake goes along with him and you know, I haven't seen the movie in many years and I don't remember. I think that she was, that she's a studio person that's kind of keeping watch on him, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. Veronica Lake was already a big enough star where one of the main taglines for this film focused on her, not Joel McRae, who is the nominal star. The title of the movie is Sullivan's Travels. Gives you an idea. He's going to go on a journey, literally, figuratively, metaphorically, metaphysically, spiritually, he's going to go on a journey. The tagline of the film, for the film, there's no stoplight and there's no break when Sullivan travels with Veronica Lake. And that is so beautiful and so fitting for this film. So John L. Sullivan, filmmaker, probable genius, but a man who wants to do more than he has already done. He goes on the road and he manages, with Veronica Lake assisting, he manages to escape the studio tail. Meaning, the people who are supposed to keep him out of harm's way, he manages, he manages to get away from them. Now I can turn this off because I'm going on the big lie, the L-I-E. But he manages to shake free. And he wants to see more. He's had a few experiences, but he wants to see more. And he gets a lot more than he ever bargained for. And yet, even with that, even with the tease, because I'm not going to spoil the big plot points, but even with the tease of things get very serious for our intrepid heroes, an eye-opening series of experiences where he may not be protected. There may be an angle here where the rest of his life is in jeopardy because of the experiences he has. And if the wrong person doesn't give a shit when he tells them his name, he could end up, lock him up, throw away the key. Again, it's 80 plus years ago. It's easy for a person to get lost if the wrong person decides to do something bad because they think or they know they can get away with it. But there is a moment in this film of such beauty and perfection that I'm in awe and I'm practically tearing up just thinking about it. And this, this I will spoil. It isn't that John Sullivan does not have respect for his talent, but he has 
undercut just how good he is at what he does. And he almost underrates the importance of laughter in life, whether it's 1940, whether it's 1980, whether it's 2020 or 2024. They don't say that laughter is the best medicine for nothing. And there is a moment in this movie where our protagonist is watching a film with more or less a room full of homeless people, of indigent people, of people whose lives have taken a terrible turn in many cases as a result of the Great Depression. And they're watching a comedy. I don't remember, I want to say that it's one of his films, but it's not really important whether it's one of his films or not. They're watching a comedy and he has an epiphany. He actually has the come to Jesus kind of moment where he realizes that these people who have nothing, nothing to look forward to, in some cases, nothing really to even look back on with pride. And so many of them are laughing and laughing and enjoying themselves and having fun and living in the moment. And he starts to realize, maybe it's okay if I stick to what I'm good at, maybe making people laugh, maybe it is enough. And it's the age old argument, it doesn't have to be a component of the movie business. It could be somebody who happens to be a writer and their parents wanted them to be a doctor, a lawyer, or if you want to go more contemporarily, one of my favorite movies, Rounders, the film about Matt Damon. You know, he's a, a, a kid who wants to play in the World Series of Poker, but he's studying to be a lawyer at what's supposed to be New York University, my alma mater, but poker seems to be his calling. And he struggles with this because there's a version of his life where he becomes a lawyer and then he ends up playing in the World Series of Poker. But maybe he should just forget it and just play. Martin Landau, the Oscar-winning actor for Tim Burton's Ed Wood, where he just so magnificent as Bela Lugosi, he is a law professor at the finest law school we're led to believe in New York. Better than Fordham, you know, that, that this, is, this is a guy who by any metric is massively successful in his life. He's been a judge, he teaches. This is, this is a very big hitter. His parents more or less disowned him because he did not follow what they wanted, what they believed was his birthright to become a rabbi. And it still hurts him that he was not able to fulfill what his parents wanted from him, expected from him. But he had to follow his calling. He had to do what was true in his heart. He could lie to himself and pretend, but then he would have been miserable. And he got so much joy doing what he did. So in this come to Jesus moment, Joel McRae, a wonderful actor, he's in an incredible Western uh, from Sam Peckinpah in the early 60s called Ride the High Country. Just absolutely spectacular. I might have to do an episode on that because you probably never even heard of Ride the High Country. This was many, many years later, two decades after Sullivan's Travels. But he has this moment where he realizes there's nothing wrong with wanting to make a movie about the plight of the homeless and the indigent. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's also nothing wrong with making movies for the express purpose of bringing joy to people's lives, even if only for 90 minutes or 100 minutes or two hours at a time. And the epiphany that he has is so beautifully handled because this is an old movie and there we know this, whether it's today, whether it's back then, things were pretty on the nose. But Joel McRae's processing of this 
it's delicate, it's really marvelous. And he, he realizes, sorry, probably got hit by a rock there. <laughs> but he realizes he is fulfilled. He is happy doing what he's doing. And he doesn't need to do anything else. It won't make his career. And I, you hate to say it like this, but he also understands that making a movie a depressive, sad, realistic kind of a film the people who need to laugh the most are not, number one, are not going to see it. And number two, they ain't going to laugh. It is ironic, and the film also doesn't beat us over the head with this. It is ironic that somebody who has made such a great living making funny films never really understood how important he already was. He thought that he was wasting his life, that he had it in him to do better work. But not everybody is meant to do everything in their chosen field. And sometimes you let someone else take a certain project. You don't need to do a certain project. You know, Martin Scorsese, it's hard to believe, but he was um, at one point even higher up in the movie industry than Spielberg. Because Spielberg had had a little bit of a dip after Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Uh, always didn't set the world on fire. Hook was not good. And Martin Scorsese was offered Schindler's List first. Now, he was never going to do it. He could have. I guarantee you, if Martin Scorsese decided to make that movie, if Spielberg said, Marty, it's too close to me, I need you to do this, he would have made a great movie. It wouldn't have been the same film that Spielberg made. They're different filmmakers. That They have the kineticism of the way they shoot in common. It would have been a different movie. But that's not something that was near and dear to Scorsese's heart the way the mob was, the way growing up Catholic, the way growing up Italian in New York City. There are certain things. Catholic guilt. See, Steven Spielberg isn't going to make a movie about Catholic guilt. You have to be okay. You have certain things that you're meant to do. You can fight against it. And he could have gone ahead, the character in this movie, and made a depressive film, made a cinema verite about people struggling, even though the depression is over. But it wasn't his calling. He was happy. He needed to have these experiences to understand how fortunate he really was. Because he said it, but I, he didn't get it until he really saw and experienced how the other half lives, lived, and tries to improve their standing when there might not just be any hope whatsoever. Now, this movie is the single favorite film, at least the last time they spoke of it, uh, The Coen Brothers. And The Coen Brothers made a film in 2000 with uh, George Clooney and John Turturro and Tim Blake Nelson, a really, really good movie called Oh Brother, where art thou? And the connection, the reason why the movie that the Coen brothers made is called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Because that is not a line of dialogue in the film. There is nothing, it is not said in the movie, George Clooney, it's not brought up. Here's some trivia for you. The reason why the film is called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That's the name of the film that John Sullivan the main character of Sullivan's Travels. That's the name of the movie he wants to make. He doesn't know exactly what it's going to be about. He doesn't know the particulars. But he wants it to be called, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And there are certain thematic and stylistic elements that the Coen brothers lifted from Sullivan's Travels. And I'm going to give a little bit away. There is a bit... There is a segment in Sullivan's Travels that deals with a chain gang, and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou also has a significant segment where there is a chain gang. They say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but the Coen brothers had so much love for that film that when they did a Criterion Collection DVD a number of years ago, it may have been as many as 20 years ago, they actually sat for... I'm not sure if they sat for a commentary track or whether they just recorded um, like a documentary 
or in other words, took part in a documentary, like a featurette on the film. I'm not sure about that. But Sullivan's Travels, I believe, is in the public domain, and you can watch it. Uh, I know that it's been on, it's been free with Amazon Prime, and it is funny. It starts off in a very lighthearted vein, and then gets more and more serious, mirroring just what you would imagine, a narrative with a three-act structure, even though this film, it seems to be kind of ambling along very amiably in very, very entertaining way. There's a lot of laughs in the first third of the film, but when things get serious, things really get serious. And the actors are all, they don't feel, it doesn't feel like they're putting on a performance. There's no winking at the audience. There's no, okay, there, the audience is kind of in on the joke and Veronica Lake is not as lovely as she is. She's not playing to the camera. Strange that I didn't talk about this movie sooner because there are a whole host of films from the first half of the 20th century that even the average film fan hasn't seen. And movies like Sullivan's Travels, I would say this is essential for any movie fan. It's that good. And Coen Brothers wouldn't talk about how great it is if it wasn't. It's kind of like Martin Scorsese, one of his favorite films, which is also under the radar. You probably never heard of this one either. Pick Up on South Street, directed by Sam Fuller, uh, who a million years later did the big red one, kind of famous war movie with um, Robert Carradine and Mark Hamill, uh, Mark Hamill, Mark Hamill um, among others. Sullivan's Travels is a treasure and it's a movie to seek out and watch and marvel at how ahead of its time it was with the, the kind of construction, not just of the narrative, but the way certain things were shot, the way it was already paying homage to movies that had been made before. There's a film from 1933, I think, um, was it Mervyn Leroy that directed? And I'm not sure about the director, but starring a great Paul Muni, who was in so many incredible films from that era, called I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. So I keep saying chain gang, but that was like, that was a real thing back then, especially Depression era. But there is a sequence in Sullivan's Travels where if the Coen brothers were paying, and you know, paying, hom uh, paying homage or doing an homage to Sullivan's Travels with Oh Brother Where Art Thou Sullivan's Travels is paying tribute paying homage to I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang it's not anything new Easter eggs or putting things in movies so that people like me say we pick up on it say oh I get it he's supposed to be the guy from that movie in 1962 right there were Easter eggs there were in jokes there are laugh lines where the audience is supposed to say, oh, I see what they're doing here. Very, very clever. Sullivan's Travels, directed by the amazing, and this is a name to Google, Preston Sturgis, was such a creative, talented filmmaker. His, his scene compositions were decades ahead of their time. The way that he cut an amazing talent, Preston Sturgis. The 20th Entry in our continuing series of the best movie you've never seen, Sullivan's Travels, directed by Preston Sturgis and starring Joel McRae, Veronica Lake, and a whole host of wonderful supporting and character actors from the era. This has been episode 252 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for taking this ride home with me on this Monday in New York. If you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform such as Podbean, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, or any of the others that it is posted to, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with a new episode real, real soon. Till then, peace out. And don't forget to laugh.